Okay, here's what I'm going to go through very quickly. Uh, I'm going to start, we're talking about why we want faster, just to sort of set the stage. Then I'm going to go into some um, measurement tools and how we measure performance. Um, how many people, I can't see you, but how many of you here were in um, Matt and Pat's talk earlier today over there? Okay, great. So I'll, I may whiz through some of this stuff because there's some of this stuff that's repeated, but um, repetition is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, we're going to spend most of our time in that third bullet. That is the site that Steve was talking about. I will unveil the mysterious candidate and uh, do what I call stepwise optimization. Uh, and then we'll finish with some lessons from the field, which uh, some of them will also be repeats to you, but uh, hopefully it'll be some new, um, new insight. Um, okay, first, just very quickly, I'm gonna keep this techie. So this is the business side. I'm gonna keep this kind of short. Um, why do we care about performance in the mobile world? Well, it shouldn't be a, a surprise to know that over the last two years, um, mobile um, sort of traffic in the, in the world has gone up. Smartphones now make up a majority of the phones that we're using, certainly in North America. This is data from um, Western Europe and Asia. You'll see that in two years, smartphone usage has uh, definitely gone up. It will also not be a surprise to you that a large amount of um, traffic on some of the world's largest sites are coming from mobile phones. And it would be a natural conclusion to say that there's a lot of money uh, being made through mobile devices, through mobile transactions. So this is a flow, let's say in the last two years, I think this is, yeah, so it's 2009 to 2011. Um, you'll see the amount of money that these four big, big e-tailers have been uh, bringing in from their um, uh, mobile presences in the world. Now, two years ago, three years ago, there was a lot of very cool studies um, uh, released by um, the likes of Google and Bing and Shopzilla, Amazon had something, uh, and that's actually still happening. The Walmart guys put out a really good study um, a couple months ago about desktop performance and its impact on business metrics. But um, on the mobile side, it's actually quite sparse. So Strangeloop actually did our own study with one of our customers. I'm gonna go through this really, really quickly. I have a link at the end of this where you can read more about the study and the couple more that were done alongside of it. This is just to set the stage. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on these things. I wanna to get to the technical part. Um, so this is a customer, I can't tell you who it is, but this is sort of what they look like. Uh, sort of top 200 internet e-tailer. Um, this is what their internet traffic looks like when it comes to mobile phones. I have a laser pointer, so let's see if I can do this. So that. That was cool. All right, so that's what their internet traffic looks like. You'll see that they're getting traffic on their full site, their M site, and their app over the last two and a half years, from 2009 until mid-2011. Um, their page views from mobile devices have gone, on, gone up five-fold, and you'll see that there is a lot of traffic hitting the site from, their, um, from mobile, their, their mobile users. So the experiment was simple. We induced latency into HTML pages on a small number of the, of the users that were hitting the site. It was a 12-week experiment. We induced three different levels of latency, 200 milliseconds, 500 milliseconds, and 1,000 milliseconds. And we watched the key metrics, the performance, uh, the, the business metrics, and their effect, uh, the effect of this like, little slowdown on those business metrics through Google Analytics and Real User Monitoring. Here are some results. Uh, you'll see that the key metrics, business metrics, like bounce rate, conversion rate, cart size, and page views, uh, sort of linearly move with performance. When, at 200 milliseconds, there isn't too much change on those guys, but you'll see that drastically things change between um, five, half a second and a second. Um, so clearly performance is having an impact on the bottom line. If you look at bounce rate over the time, you'll see that this is, a little clarification, that's actually negative change from the baseline, right? So this is the bounce rate over the 12 weeks between the 500 millisecond and the one second um, latencies. And there's a hangover syndrome, which means after the performance, uh, the test stopped, some of the stuff was still in the user base because they were still, they sort of not liked what was happening to them here. So there was, it was, uh, there was a little bit of a hangover there. So bottom line, performance matters in mobile as much as it did in desktop. Um, may, hopefully there'll be more studies. We're working on more data always. Maybe part of this is that it's now um, sort of inherent to us that faster is better and we don't need to do lots of studies, but um, this is one and faster is better. Here's an example. If you wanna see more on this stuff, here's some links. This presentation will go up online right after this. I'll give you the links and where you can find it. So if you wanna do any more reading about this stuff, you can go over there. Now, so we're talking about fast. Faster is better. What do I know, how, how do I know my, how fast my site is? So I wanna talk about measurement a little bit. 
in the mobile world. And again, some of this stuff you've heard already a couple hours ago in the room next door. Um, Pat and Matt did a great job um, talking about the, the tools out there. It's actually more comprehensive than what I have here. This is just a little sampling. Um, I definitely encourage you to look through, if mobile performance is important to you, go through their presentation and see all the tools that are out there. I can tell you that, um, I think it was Matt earlier, he said mobile measurement is a, is a hairy. Um, I don't think it was supposed to be a compliment, but I kind of took it as one. Um, I have, yeah, never mind. Uh, so, so it's more complicated, it is more involved, and there's more unknowns when it comes to mobile performance. We're sort of in the early stages of our learning curve when it comes to mobile uh, performance measurement. So it's more complicated, it's still a lot of, there's a lot of manual components involved, there's a lot of simulation. Uh, they're going to, like there's um, tools out there that simulate mobile behavior. There's uh, the, the, the iOS simulators that run in desktops. They're great, but they're not the real thing. Things are getting better. Uh, but we're not there yet. So I'm gonna go through some tools just really quickly and then I'm gonna end with the, the tool that I use primarily for everything I'm gonna do in this presentation. Um, so just a couple of um, uh, side notes here on the other tools. There is the Chrome uh, remote debugging available on ICS Ice Cream Sandwich. It is actually great. You hook up a USB uh, cable to your computer, you browse the net with Chrome through the normal data connection, and you get to see essentially all the Chrome debugging tools that you may be used to, oh, like these, on your desktop. It's kind of really cool. You get to sort of uh, evaluate the HTML, look at the network traffic, things like this. Um, so that's a good tool, ICS Chrome only. Um, there's the iWeb Inspector. That sort of gives you what the Web Inspector gives you for Safari, but for iOS environments. It uses the iOS simulator, so that's the desktop simulator. Also gives you a similar view right here of the sort of things that you're expected to see from the, from the Web Inspector. Um, Winery, I saw a video on this. I was researching this. I saw a video on this. Somebody called it Wiener. Uh, I thought that was cool. I guess that's not a normal English word, so I really wanted to be careful with what I call it. So I did some research. It's apparently Winery. Uh, it's actually a great tool. You put JavaScript in your page, and you can do some uh, remote debugging um, of what's happening on the page, sort of on your desktop. There's a link to it. Um, again, I'll publish this uh, presentation after if you're interested, take a look. There's something called Ardwolf, um, which kind of sounds like a mutant aardvark, like wolfy animal at first. I, I'm not a JavaScript guy, so I didn't actually dig into it too much, but I, and our guys use it. Um, so it's uh, remote debugging of JavaScript, um, and it's uh, available for both platforms. Interesting um, if you're doing any sort of heavy duty JavaScript. Um, of course, of course, Steve Souders has given us tools. Of course he has. Uh, the, the mobile perf bookmarklet is like a super bookmarklet. So all these tools right here are all tools that are good for performance, sort of gauging performance on a website, uh, on your mobile device. So there's the link for it. If you haven't used it already, use it. It's a little challenging on the, on the, on the phone form factor. Uh, but there's a lot of information in there. He gives you what's happening in local storage. He gives you stuff with CSS. There's a DOM inspector if you support web timings. There's web timings right there if the browser supports it. Uh, local storage, Wyslow. Uh, it's great. It's like a good, um, like a like a good toolkit to have. It's I have it on all my phones. There's a bookmark for it. Um, I'm a networking guy. I spent most of my time in Wireshark captures. I'm not proud of it, but I, this is what happens. So this is one of my favorite tools. You load up packet captures to this thing, and it gives you uh, basically a waterfall. Um, the, it's a great tool. Uh, Pat called it old school earlier today. It's a little old school, but we, um, we use it when we want to gauge what's actually happening on the network. It turns out to be an excellent way to see what's happening on the network. It's just a little tedious. Um, let's not forget, and I'm a huge fan of this, um, RUM. So real user monitoring. This is when you put JavaScript tags in your pages. There's beacons that go back from the page to some data warehouse that collects performance metrics on your site. It can use navigation timing if your browser supports navigation timing. It is excellent. It is the way to see what your real users in the world are experiencing in terms of performance. It is awesome to see these guys 
get into this because they are now tracking page performance and they're giving you the ability to monitor specific events on the page and the performance of those events. It's great. They're adding the same extensibility that you had with custom variables and user-defined variables for marketing tracking to performance, which is great, great to see. Um, so RUM is, a, is definitely a tool out there. We have to use it. You need a lot of data to draw good conclusions. You have to be careful about outliers. But um, I would highly recommend, if you care about performance, look into some way of doing RUM. Uh, vendors were maybe sparse two or three years ago. There's more vendors showing up. I saw talks at this conference with vendors talking about RUM. Definitely look into RUM. And, of course, I must land here. Web page test, if you don't know this, come out of the dark ages. Web page test is a fantastic tool for um, measuring website performance, visualizing it, and seeing how uh, pages are actually rendering on browsers. Just this morning, it was a great surprise to know that the mobile performance side of it, the mobile testing, was released. So if you go to webpagetest.org now, you have uh, an, an, uh, an Android phone and, and, an, um, and an iPhone, I think, that you can do testing from. Um, what I used for this entire presentation is the private instance of Web Page Test and the private agents. Um, the agents, thanks to the guys at Blaze, it was open source recently, the MOBA test agent. Um, so it's being integrated into the Web Page Test infrastructure. Um, my guys and Pat and Sam, he's not here, I don't think, but a huge shout out to him. He's here, great. I'd like to see him and say hi, high five. Um, we, our, our guys worked with uh, Pat and Sam to make sure um, that the performance measurements were accurate. That's the tool I'm using um, for everything that we do here. Uh, it's available for Android and iOS, like Pat said earlier today. It, it's got a few kinks. It doesn't have all the features that you're used to in web page tests, like scripting, which is what I, I use a lot when it comes to desktop testing. But when it comes to testing pages, what do they look like? How do they render? Can I have a waterfall that's um, sort of descriptive? It has all that stuff. It's still the sort of the best tool out there. The iOS one's a little, sh it's, a, it's a little less, um, I wouldn't say reliable. It's actually reliable. It's a, it's a little less insightful, let's say, because it uses UI WebView, so it's not um, the actual Safari browser, and you don't get the, the cool, colorful uh, waterfalls yet. Um, so what I do for the rest of this presentation, and I'll get into methodology later, is going to be mostly Android-based because I just have more visibility there. It's a great tool. If you haven't uh, used it before, make sure you use it. And if, you're, um, if you haven't brought Web Page Test into your um, organization to have private instances, I would highly recommend that. Root your phones, get this thing on there, and get some real mobile measurements going. Um, we have a mobile web page, uh, web page test infrastructure at Strange Loop that we use extensively, and now it has mobile agents as a big part of it. Um, a quick review of um, looking at performance, visualizing performance. Um, this may have been news a couple of years ago. Hopefully a lot of you guys have seen waterfalls. I'm just going to go through this really, really quickly to set the stage for what it looks like. I'm going to have a lot of these things later. So I want to make sure you guys all understand and know what this stuff is. This is a sample waterfall. This is actually from a um, talk that I did a few months ago at a different conference. This is the homepage of that conference. It's just a reference. Um, if you haven't looked at waterfalls before, each of those components are broken down. Each of those, each of those rows are requests. You see it's a cascading sort of <clears throat> waterfall view right there. Each of those rows is one of the requests. They have multiple components. They may have DNS time. They may have TCP connect time. They must have time to first byte, which is the time it takes for the request to go and the first byte of the response to come back, and of course some time related to downloading the object. Um, those components are e each of those lines. When we look at these um, waterfalls, uh, if you aren't familiar with these terms, we define um, the time it takes to get the HTML, which is the base page, the one that references all the resources inside the page as the back end time, and everything afterwards we call front end. This is why front end optimization is such a big deal, as you can see. There is a lot of this color, the purplish thing, and there's a lot less of the orangish thing. Um, we look at two timers specifically, or primarily, let's say. We look at document complete time, which is also the onload time. You guys may know it as the onload time. We use that as the primary um, metric. It's the best one we have at the moment. Uh, we also definitely look at start render time, and start render time has become more important recently um, as visualization and the visual snappiness of a page has become sort of more front and center. So those two timers are t timers that um, we focus on. I'm going to focus on them when it comes to the rest of this presentation. 
Okay, that was all in 15 minutes, so let's get to the meat. Uh, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna pick a site. Uh, we're gonna, actually, let me tell you what this, this part, and then I'll tell you about the site later. Um, here's what I did for this entire presentation. There's a Nexus S phone, which has the, the web page test agent on it. I did all my testing from Vancouver. That's where I was the last couple of weeks. Um, it uses the Rogers network. Everything is 3G, so I had, I had no Wi-Fi in any part of this. I want to test over real cellular networks. Um, traffic goes through the Strange Loop service. We have a service offering that does optimization sort of in the, in the cloud. Um, uh, the, all the traffic goes through the service. Um, I had little um, control over DNS overriding because the web page test client doesn't have the, the scripting features yet, so I used host files. So you'll, you'll see a slight um, absence of DNS calls in these waterfalls that I'm gonna show you, but it's across the board, so I didn't, um, I didn't skew it one way or another. Um, so the real times on these will be a tiny bit shifted to the right, but never you worry. It's, uh, it's, uh, it was the best way we could test um, with the agent at the moment. Phone does everything else. It's uh, as close to the browser as possible, and we visualize waterfalls and we analyze waterfalls. This is what it kind of looks like. Um, cloud, it goes to the origin site, whatever that site will be. I'll tell you in a second. Um, 3G connection up here. Here's a little speed test that I did. That's actually what the characteristics of that line was. This was, I was sitting in my office just doing the, the test. <clears throat> in the interest of time, um, I'm going to use the cooking show methodology, uh, except no tiger blood. Uh, what we'll do, nothing. Uh, <laughs> okay. What we'll do is um, we'll layer in acceleration functionality bit by bit by bit by bit. And so if for each of those steps, there'll be like a um, baking slide uh, where lay things have been layered in, and then I'll do a before and after waterfall, waterfall comparison to see um, what the impact of the particular techniques that we used were on the waterfall as, and the site as we go forward. Um, I will also show you, and this is really exciting, uh, videos. There'll be a lot of videos. So you'll see actually what these pages look like when they, um, when they render. That is something that is working in the web page test agent and is highly, highly valuable. Um, like Steve said, two years ago when we did this, we picked the Velocity site, um, primarily because uh, we're cheeky. So um, this year, I'm like, I'm gonna do it again. So I went to the Velocity site the Velocity site, the Velocity conference site, is a mobile-specific, kind of a lean site. It was actually kind of cool to see it. It's got a bunch of text, maybe two images, so it looked really lean. So maybe it wasn't the best candidate. I'm like, okay, I can't. I have to be cheeky, but it looks like I can't use the Velocity site. So times have changed. Uh, the cheekiness hasn't. So, um, <laughs> so I'm going to use the O'Reilly site. Um, to show everything that's gonna happen here. Now, I know I gotta throw caveats in here. I'm only doing this for fun. This is not the real O'Reilly site, okay? It went through our cloud. I have control over that, so I actually dialed it back, right? So I killed certain features that were already part of the site. I'm not picking on the O'Reilly site. This is just for cheekiness. The actual site is actually somewhere in here. I'm not gonna tell you where, but rest assured that it is not as bad as what I'll show you here. Um, and it doesn't mean, I can't iterate this enough, it doesn't mean that the, that the site has these problems. Please, please like me and let me come back. Um, okay, let's start. So the worst version of the site, again, I made it this bad, so this is not, I can't iterate this enough. The site is not this bad to start with. The worst version, Basically, the site that I ruined, just to be clear, I'll say it on video, I ruined the site personally, looks like this, okay? This is not what the users are experiencing, this is me ruining it. It's like, that's clear, right? We're good. The microphone's still on, all right, we're good. Okay, um, this is what the waterfall looks like, and this is what the key performance metrics look like. Now, you're gonna see a lot of this stuff, and every waterfall you're gonna see from this point on is a mobile waterfall. So this was actually on that Nexus S, this is what it looked like when it downloaded all the objects and, show, and, and rendered the page. These are the metrics as web page test shows you. So these are all the core metrics. I'm going to focus most of this presentation on these four metrics, which are start render time, 
document complete time right there, and these two metrics, which are requests and bytes to unload, as sort of proxies. As these numbers go down, I expect these two performance metrics to go down. So these four things are gonna be tracked throughout this whole presentation. I'm gonna make sure that you know the impact on these four things as we step through the, uh, the, uh, the acceleration steps. Uh, if you aren't familiar with what web page test gives you after you do a test on a site, here's a per object breakdown. You'll see every single one of the objects is partial because that thing is actually much longer, so there's stuff down here. Um, you'll see the, the penalties you pay for initial connection, connection, time to first byte, download time, et cetera, et cetera. Here's the content breakdown. You'll see that the core of the content is coming from these objects types here. You'll see that this is the mixture. This is a nice little graph that WebPageTest gives you. Hopefully, you guys have all played with WebPageTest. Know this. In the mobile world, you get the same sort of metrics that you saw uh, before. On this site that I have ruined personally, let's study the, uh, the problems that are there. So again, the site's ruined. <laughs> I can't, really can't emphasize this enough um, by me. And now I'm going to th go through all the things that are wrong with it after I ruined it. So first. There's too many connections. See all those orange things? See all these orange things? Well, every one of those is connection setup time. This is mobile. This is a cell network. We're talking about hundreds of milliseconds of round trip. Those are serious penalties that we're paying. So that certainly contributes to this terrible time that I've created for this page. What else? This is the connection cost, by the way, just to give you a, a sort of a, a, a feel for what that penalty is that we're paying for every one of those connections that we're setting up. There's too many bytes, okay? I, I, for this site, there's almost a meg of data that I download to my phone. And that meg is mostly this stuff right here. So that's a lot of bytes that I'm downloading. This is not a best practice site, right? Because I ruined it. So there's a lot of bytes. If nobody had cared about performance, there'd be a lot of bytes that would need to come to the phone. That's a problem with the site. What else? Well, there's no CDN. So what's a CDN do? A CDN makes things get closer to the users. They, it sort of uh, reduces the, the time to first byte. So this column, which is the time to first byte for all these objects that I'm going to fetch, is quite affected by the fact that there's no CDN. The way they did that, did that on this site, by the way, is I forced requests to go from Vancouver all the way to the East Coast. So there's a transcontinental trip that every one of these things has taken. That's the penalty we're paying right there because we didn't use a CDN. What else? Here's a little review of what, we've, uh, what the time to first byte is. I want to concentrate on time to first byte because there's multiple problem areas that affect time to first byte. CDN is one of them. Um, the, the fact that there's concurrency in the mobile browsers, um, so the Android browser, the stock browser, I think uses four concurrent connections, right? Four. And iOS is higher. Um, it's helping. It's not the old way where IE6 had two. Um, so it's helping. There's pipelining is helping. I'm going to have more on pipelining later. But these are a big problem. Time to first byte on cell phones is a big deal because round trip time is a big deal and large on cell networks. Let's keep going. There's too many round trips. So on this particular site that I crapped on, there is 93 round trips. Actually, this is the, mo the most important one. 93 round trips to the onload event. That's a lot of round trips. Every one of those needs to go over the cell network and incur the terrible latency that that network's given us. So because there are so many round trips, that time to first byte problem is exacerbated, right? So, so we have a problem with requests traversing the network. Every one of those has to be a penalty. This is a function of HTTP, which needs to request and respond, request and respond. All this stuff needs to go and come back and go and come back. It's a big problem. Again, concurrency helps, but t time to first byte is a big problem when it comes to mobile platforms. It's still a big problem on desktop, but it's really exacerbated when it comes to mobile platforms. Let's keep going. Poor caching. Take my word for this. I'm actually not going to do any caching analysis on the site. I have more on caching later. And, and the primary purpose for that is that I want to tell you, hey, caching is great. Here's 15 slides to prove it. It's kind of, kind of a given that caching is great. But there are nuances with caching when it comes to mobile. So I'm going to put an asterisk on this and come back to this later. <clears throat> There's a lot of third-party calls. So third-party, what is third-party? Analytics, uh, marketing tags, ads, blah, blah, blah. All these third-party calls, which are put into the site, probably more the marketing departments, affect performance. We can't, I can't, I really can't emphasize this enough. One of the biggest performance problems in, in our performance community right now 
is the impact of third-party calls. Look, here's just a subsection of that, of that uh, waterfall. These guys are third-party calls. These are things that need to go somewhere else to be, get fetched to render the page. And some of this stuff is like a, like, a, it's like a domino effect. So this guy needs to fetch this guy. This guy's a redirect. It goes here. So those three are basically from one little tag that was put in the page. So that's, that's uh, analytics specifically. Notice that all this stuff is happening. And this is just an example, right? All this stuff is happening before start render. So imagine that these examples that I'm showing you here, and there's more down here, but these particular examples are actually affecting the start render of this page on my mobile phone. So that is a problem. Now, maybe they need to take, a, take place in that particular place in the page. There are some nuances there, but there is no doubt that these guys are affecting the performance of the page. These things kind of seem similar to the sort of stuff that we talk about with, uh, with desktops. That's not a coincidence. When it's, something is a problem when it comes to network traversal, uh, rendering on a browser, problem, it's a problem regardless of the platform. The application of it and the impact is a bit different on mobile devices. So that's why I'm going to concentrate on mobile techniques, what we do for mobile uh, devices, and show you what happens as we uh, sort of step by step accelerate the site um, through application of these um, um, sort of features and techniques. Most importantly, you got to see what it looks like. So here's a little movie. All right, so that's fine. <laughs> okay, so wow, that looks like a really bad site that I broke. Quick summary of the key metrics. These are the four things that I'm going to focus on everywhere in this presentation, and I'm going to show you a nice little pre-graph. So here's where they start. See those dots? By the end of this, there'll be other dots here and lines and colors, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Okay, let's fix it. What are we going to do? We are going to do, again, stepwise acceleration. I'm going to add um, optimization um, techniques little by little to the site. So every iteration is going to inherit everything that I did before. So it's just going to be step by step by step. Um, and I'm going to start with the easy stuff. And then it's going to get harder and harder and harder. And hopefully, we're going to get this page to be the fastest possible. We're going to make it really, really fast. Because it's so slow because I ruined it, right? OK, low hanging fruit. I'm going to start with really easy stuff, basically switches that you can turn on in parts of the infrastructure. So remember all those connections that we had? There was 83-something connections. So we're going to enable TCP keep alive, uh, HTTP keep alive, and make those sure the connections are kept open throughout the, the life cycle of the page rendering. And I'm going to add just basic HTTP compression to the mix, which will, for me, compress um, the textual content on the page. So with keep alive, I'm going to affect the initial connection penalty that I'm paying for every one of those connections that I'm opening. So these 83 should hopefully get lower. With compression, I'm going to affect bytes. So after compression, I should see that number go down. And I should see the penalty that I pay for content download time. I should see that column get affected. And these types of objects, JavaScript, CSS, and HTML, so the textual stuff, should reduce in number of bytes. So that is what I should expect. I should expect fewer total connections. I should expect fewer bytes. And on the four key metrics that I'm keeping track of, I'm not going to change the round trips because I'm not doing anything to, to address the round trip problem. I will see fewer bytes to unload. I will hopefully see a better document complete time and a better start render time. So let's cook and study the waterfalls before and after. This is where we were before on that site that I really made terrible. Just by adding two little features, like keep alive and compression, I got it to be here. So I went from 20 seconds on load to 15 seconds on load. You'll see that the blue line certainly moved to the left. Let's do a quick comparison of the key metrics. Like I said, we saw the total number of bytes go down. I see that the document complete time is lower, and my start render time got better. So by turning on two little things, very easy things, probably part of your um, server, load balancer, uh, whatever infrastructure proxy configuration, two probably switches, just individual switches, I was able to help this page get faster. How much faster, you ask? Wow, that's a good question. This is where we were before. This is where we are now. 
Here, just, just hold on. I spent a lot of time on this. Pretty cool, right? All right? Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Pixar's calling. Um, OK, so, so this is where we're at. Notice that we have 20% uh, um, um, improvement for bytes and doc complete time. We did almost 10%, um, 9% uh, on start render time. We made improvements. The page got faster, and I did some two very, very, very simple things. Now, metrics are one thing. How does it look? Well, let's find out. I gray the pages out when the, when the page is fully rendered. That was better, right? So with two little configuration changes probably in my infrastructure, by enabling connection keep alive and compression, voila, I have a faster um, web page. Now, it's not as fast as I'd like, obviously. Otherwise, I'd only have a 30-minute presentation and not 90. Um, so we're going to do more. But with two little things, very easy things, I was able to impact performance um, quite well, actually. What are the pros of this? It's really easy to do. I think I've uh, sort of said that, uh, beat that dead horse. Um, and it's just usually a very simple um, uh, configuration. It's great bang for the buck, but it's still slow. And these things by themselves are just not enough. Because as you saw, the left video was faster than the right video, but the left video was still too slow. So what's next? Um, CDNs. Let's add CDN to the mix. Now, just a quick review of CDNs. I'm sure you all know this, so I'll just make this very, very quick. CDNs are a global, globally distributed um, uh, network of caches. They they're have global reach, global footprints. The idea is that the devices, desktop or mobile, whatever it may be, fetch static objects from a cache that's near them rather than having to go all the way to origin, wherever that origin may be, for everything that they need to fetch. Right. So it's physics. You get things closer to where they're going, they get there faster. So static resources are coming from the CDN, and the time to first byte column should get affected. So this, this is the column that the CDN is going to affect. This particular column, which is the time to first byte, which is what we've sort of decreased by bringing the content closer to the users, is going to hopefully, by deploying a CDN, get better. What should we expect from this deployment? Well my average time to first byte should get better. So I do definitely expect that because I'm going to use a CDN. Um, my impact on performance metrics, if the CDN does as I wish, as I hope, are these things. I don't expect any change to round trips because I haven't done anything to uh, fix the round trip issue. I uh, will not notice a difference to byte count because I've already turned on compression. So that's going to stay. But I should get better start render and better doc complete time. So those things should happen. Let's it and let's look at the waterfalls before and after so this is now CDNs coming into the picture this is the waterfall before this is the waterfall after you'll notice these greens actually are noticeably smaller there but let me do an analysis like this again I can't show you the entire breakdown that's the time to first byte column before I had a huge average and by adding the CDN I have a sorry this thing's in front of me whatever that number is um, I have a smaller average. Clearly, I have helped time to first byte. What is my impact on the key metrics? Well, I didn't do anything to round trips. I didn't change the byte count, but I did help start render and um, doc complete time. So that's great. Let's go back to our really, really fancy graphs. This is where we were at before. We added CDNs, and voila, next step. So we've impacted performance. Our two key metrics, performance metrics, got better. And um, CDN, the, the physics of it work. Let's see what it looks like, because that's ultimately what matters. Noticeably faster, right? So faster site as a CDN should give me. <clears throat> Pros and cons. CDN, this CDN world is an established industry. Physics works. You get things closer to where they need to go. Things are going to be faster. 
physics is awesome, um, and it's a you know it's a, there's lots of vendors. The cons are that CDNs are typically um, services that you have to buy, so it could get costly. There's a lot of vendors out there, a lot of choice, a lot of choices, so um, you can pick and choose based on your needs. And I don't know if this is a con, but I wanted to get faster. So the fact that it wasn't faster started me down a path that's going to end in controversy. So let me tread this water carefully. Um, we got faster, but I was kind of hoping for more. So I really started thinking, I love CDNs. I've been in the networking world for a long time. I believe in CDNs. I believe in Newton, so it works. I get it. Um, but I kind of wanted this to be faster. So what I did, what I had done, was the way I broke the CDN part of it was I had um, sort of uh, uh, forced the request to go all the way to the East Coast from, from Vancouver. And this test, I let it do its thing. Like I had the CDN pick the best edge for me. Um, but it still wasn't as fast as I wanted. Um, so I started asking some questions, which is where Pink Panther comes in. I started wondering out loud, this notion of edge selection with CDNs, does the model change when I go to a mobile world? Just easy, I just asked the question. That's all this is. I'm just asking a question out loud with some of my really, really good friends at Velocity. 3G is a mystery, right? So the question was meant to be asked. So there's just a 30 second um, sort of break here. The way edges are selected in CDNs, typically, this is not every CDN, there is a DNS magic that happens. There's some sort of DNS magic that is based on the guy that's asking the question on your behalf. So when you're on your desktop, mobile phone, wherever you may be, and you want to go to www.site.com, you ask a DNS server, and there's this beautiful DNS mechanism that goes on in the world that asks the DNS brains that's responsible for that site to give you an IP address. Well, when CDNs make decisions, typically, I'm going to anger so many people, but it's fine. This is the question that needs to be asked. Typically, CDNs, the basics model, CDN makes a decision based on where your DNS resolver came from. Now, in our world, it's sort of OK to assume that your DNS resolver is near you. When this stuff first started coming out, I used to work for a company who made global load balancing um, products. We had a DNS solution. And we had this issue where if I'm in an office on the West Coast and I have a static IP address and I move to the East Coast, my DNS queries are going to be coming from the West Coast. Doesn't that, doesn't that screw stuff up when it comes to global load balancing? Yeah, but it's not that big a deal. It's less prevalent, blah, 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 blah. This is something that just happens all the time. And these days, it's somewhat fair to assume that your DNS resolver is somewhere near you. Now, that's not perfect. I'm sure that CDN vendors will also tell you that that is not a perfect science. The only thing I know is that when the cell phone gets involved, this is kind of a mystery. Because what happens is my cell phone goes into this black box of a cell network that is this huge, mysterious area. And who knows where that query squirts out of. Like, I have no idea where that thing's going to come from, right? Because that's a mystery to me. I am ignorant, DNS friends, so I don't know the answer to this question. I'll give you an example. Um, we have a guy, one of, the, one of my colleagues, um, lives in Dallas. I set up a little test, just a, like a little experiment, and I had him do a lookup to a CDN domain that I own. His query came from Dallas. That's cool. That's, sort of, that's, a good, that's an answer to this question. That's great. Uh, he's on vacation in Missouri this week. I had him do the same thing for Missouri. I, I didn't call him on his vacation. He, he volunteered, so take it easy. Um, his query, when he, did this, he went to the same website from Missouri, came from Dallas. Hmm, that's interesting. My brother lives in LA. From his home, he went to a site that I provided for him. His DNS query came from Seattle. This was on a 3G network. Um, this remains the, I can't get rid of this question mark right now. This question mark is a question for me. So I want to get the answer to this question. At the end of this presentation, I'm going to have you guys help me figure this out. I've set up an experiment. I'm going to need your help to collect some data and maybe, maybe, maybe answer this question a little bit. Now, not having you guys, I just sort of saw this a few days ago, not having you guys there to help me out to crowdsource this great, great research that we're about to do together. Um, I, I still wanted answers to this question. So I did a little test myself. Again, this is um, just a test I did just sitting in my office in Vancouver. Please don't um, lynch me. I'm not, my plan is not to anger a lot of people here. Um, I've tried to explain this to many people over the last two days. Um, 
and it's been difficult, so I'm doing this wrong, so I'm going to try a different approach to see if this makes sense. Here's what I did. This is a terminal on the phone, OK, just to be clear. It's on my phone. It's not this phone, but it's a phone like this. So I actually have a terminal program running on my rooted phone. I blocked out all these things because there's two different CDNs. I'm not finger pointing. I'm just running an experiment because I'm curious as to what the physics of this thing is. OK, here's what I'm doing. To start with, again, two different CDNs. I ping a domain name from the phone that I know is hosted by a CDN. So these numbers right here is what the phone network tells me for an IP address, and I ping that IP address. That's the round trip time. Okay? This is what the phone got resolved as an IP address. That's the stuff. That's that guy and that guy. This dude is me pinging from the phone an IP address that the CDN network chose to give my desktop. Does that make sense? My desktop, I did the same lookup from my desktop, got a different IP address, and I pinged that IP address from my phone. So both these pings are happening from my phone. That's the IP that my phone naturally got. This is the IP that my desktop got, and I gave it to the phone to ping. What I found really interesting is that this round trip time is actually like 70 milliseconds less than this round trip time. And this round trip time is over 100 milliseconds less than this round trip time. Huh, that's weird. Does that mean there's a better edge for me for these two CDNs than the one that the CDNs chose to give me? I don't know. Now, this is one test. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not drawing any huge, massive conclusions. I'm not going to. You guys are going to help me get some data on this so we can sort of figure this out together. I know, I know this is not going to be a popular uh, suggestion, and I'm not suggesting anything. I'm not making any outrageous claims like I invented the question mark. Who got it? Who got it? All right, maybe two people. Um, not making crazy claims. This is just interesting. And we are amongst friends here. This is a technical community. Questions are important. So all I'm doing here is asking a question. And I'm going to try to answer it, but I can't guarantee that I'll have an answer. That black box, which is the cell network, is a mystery to all of us, man. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try. Um, but it is possible that the notion of closeness is a little bit different when it comes to CDNs and mobile. It is possible, only from the very, very small amount of data that I have. I hope that's not necessarily broad and disturbing to the, to the, enter, to the, um, to the uh, industry. And I'm sure that CDNs have edge caches near the squirt points of these cell networks. And that, by that meaning, they, they mean the exit point. For some reason, I see a squirt coming out of the coming out of the networks. So I'm sure there's caches there. But if the majority of the latency is inside that cell network, then you know, CDNs probably help when the request comes out of the network. But maybe the impact is a little bit less. I'm just asking a question. More research is necessary. You guys are going to help me, hopefully, get some of the answers. So at the very end of this, I have a little thing for you guys to try. Um, and if the, we get enough of you to do it, um, I'll make sure that Joshua puts it on his blog. OK. After that controversial commercial break, let's go back to our stepwise acceleration. Where were we so far? We added Keep Alive and Compression and made the site that I made horrible a little bit better. We added CDNs, and it got better. Maybe not as much as we liked, but it got better. Certainly, the video showed a significant visual difference in the, in the, in the site. Now I'd like to add mobile front-end optimization. So mobile FEO is the next step. What's mobile FEO? Well, I'm actually going to layer it in little by little. Um, I'm going to start with some basic stuff. So basic stuff is I'm going to consolidate resources. So there were 90 some odd round trips on, on that particular site that I ruined. Um, those round trips are all causing, of course, the TTFB problem to be exacerbated. I'm going to consolidate resources, which means images, CSS, and JavaScript, hopefully, after I'm done and if, if everything goes according to plan, will, will constitute less round trips. So that's what I'm going to do there. I'm going to layer in image compression, which should help the reduction in bytes. I already did that with HTTP compression. Image compression is more sophisticated. I'm going to do that for um, the images on the page. Because it's a mobile device, I can be a little bit more aggressive because the form factor is so small that I can on a desktop. I'm going to add minification of JavaScript and CSS. I don't want to use local storage optimally. I'll talk more about local storage later. So what I expect to impact or by the reduction in resources uh, in, in uh, round trips, I expect to impact the time to first byte column. Now, I expect to impact that by removing rows altogether. 
So when a CDN is supposed to make these numbers smaller, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to get rid of rows. So getting rid of rows should definitely address the problem or part of the problem, right? And I'm going to, by um, doing minification and image compression, I'm going to address the bytes that are associated to my images and JavaScript and CSS. What should I expect after I do this? Well, I should expect less round trips, meaning the time to first byte problem will get better. I should expect less bytes from those resources that HTTP compression didn't touch before, so the non-textual stuff. So images and CSS should give me less bytes. I should see a difference in all four metrics that I'm monitoring, right? I should see less round trips. This is the first time we're addressing something with round trips before onload. So I should see less round trips to onload. I should see a reduction in byte count to onload again on top of what HTTP compression already gave me. <clears throat> I hope to see a better start render time and I hope to see a better doc complete time, and I hope to see a better video, right, because it's the visual response. Let's put it into our industrial cook machine, and let's evaluate the waterfalls before and after. So that's the waterfall that we were at when we got done CDNing the site, and this is the waterfall that we have, thankfully a bit more zoomed, of the site as we have now. Key metric, in this case, 13.7. We went down to 9.5 or 9.47. Let's take a look at the four metrics that we touched here. So let's start with round trips. This is the first time we've affected round trips. We went from 92 to 28. That's a good reduction in round trips. I got rid of all those time to first byte penalties that I had to pay. <clears throat> My byte count to unload is quite a bit less because I've done these levels of byte reduction through minification and image compression. Core of this is image compression, actually. Lots of images on that page. <clears throat> My start render time got a lot better. This is actually really nice. I should see a great visual snappiness in the page, uh, greater visual snappiness in the page, and my doc complete time is better. <clears throat> so let's go back to our very, very sophisticated tracking system. This is where we were before, and we see some slopes now. So by layering in these somewhat basic um, uh, features and techniques, we got better on the four core metrics that we're looking for. Uh, round trips and bytes got significantly reduced, and my start render and doc complete time um, got a lot better. The question everyone's asking is, how does that look? Well, I'm glad you asked. So in the fourth step, in the third step of our optimization life cycle, we are now at a place where the site is snappier. We've done a number of optimization techniques. We've done the basic stuff. We've added CDNs. We've done some good mobile FEO. And now we have a site that starts rendering at about three plus seconds, three and a half seconds, and uh, much snappier and visually much more performant. So we're in a pretty good place. <clears throat> the pros and cons and everything I've done in this step include that obviously the pros are it's very noticeable. I, draw, I, I, I affected all my key metrics, visually I'm better, and I see a good benefit, the slopes got better, right? I see a good benefit of um, uh, the techniques that I've used. So I saw good benefits in those techniques. Um, the mobile form factor lets me be a bit more aggressive, so the sort of image compression, I can be a little bit more aggressive with image compression and still make sure the site is good. This particular site actually, it's, it's, the entire thing shows up on the device at once, so it's like, it's everything's tiny, so for that first, um, uh, sort of visual response, I can be a little aggressive, uh, but that depends on um, whatever you choose to do for your own site. Um, and I use local storage smartly, which I'm going to talk about later. Um, the cons are that this is not easy. So this is where things get a little bit more difficult. This is why there's products out there that do this stuff automatically. Um, and this stuff needs to um, survive regression. So when you change your site, the techniques need to sort of stay. You can't have to, you don't have to, you can't have it, so you have to redo the techniques every time um, you change your site. Or maybe you do, and that's one of the reasons that this is such a difficult problem. <clears throat> my fourth step, and this is my last one, is to layer in more mobile FEO. And in this case, I'm going to focus on deferral. So remember we talked about third parties. Remember these things that we talked about earlier, which are the analytics, marketing tags, ads, blah, 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 these guys? These guys <clears throat> are still in the page. They are affecting both my performance metrics, which are start, render, and on load time. And if you look at the last waterfall, this is where we're at right now. Check this out. Those things are external calls to third parties. They're affecting me. Most of that stuff, actually all of that stuff, is happening before the on load event. 
right? So I have some room here to do some deferral, meaning move this stuff to the right of that line and hopefully make for a snappier page and hopefully move on load time and um, start render, uh, on load time and start render time over to the left. What am I going to do? <clears throat> I'm going to defer the round trips that are for those third parties to after onload, and I should expect fewer round trips to onload because I deferred them, so they, I moved them from the left of the blue line to the right of the blue line. I should get less bytes to onload because those bytes aren't there since I removed the round trips and moved the round trips. And I hope to see better start render time and better um, doc complete time. Probably my favorite picture ever. It's really funny. I don't know. I, you type in uh, you do a Google search for oven on fire, and that's where you get. And let's analyze what the before and after waterfalls look like. Now, at first glance, they actually don't look that different, right? But if you notice, that blue line sort of moved because I took some of the stuff that was on the left and brought them over to the right. So look, notice what's happening post on load. Not much before and quite a bit now, right? So those tags and those third party calls have been deferred. I've moved them to the right of the on load time. I've affected my key metrics actually quite significantly. Look at this one. I like this one, right? That's pretty cool. So by doing some smart deferral and letting those third party tags, preventing those third party tags from the penalty that they incur on my site, uh, preventing them from incurring the penalty on my site, I've, I was able to impact the core uh, performance metrics rather well. Let's do a quick visual inspection. Went from 28 round trips to 10. This is to, to onload. Notice that I moved these. So the total number of round trips haven't changed all that much. But that's what's happened to onload time. And my start render time, look at that, went from 3 plus to just over 2. That's really nice. And the performance tracker says, that I was able to continue with my downward slope. Um, notice that we're at the end of the graph, so this is the last step. That's kind of cool. And I've had significant benefits to all my metrics that I'm keeping track of. And of course, the natural question now is what does this look like? And I will tell you what it looks like. Show you, actually. <laughs> From the man himself. Right? Visually snappier, I went from a start render time of seven plus seconds to just over two. That is significant. By layering in all these techniques, I've been able to help my onload time. I've made the page visually snappier. And from a 3G phone on a 3G network, I was able to get the page to something that could pass as acceptable, which is great because it certainly wasn't when I crapped on it. Pros and cons? Thank you. Pros and cons, this part was actually the hardest part. You have to be careful with these third-party analytic tools. Um, you have to know what they're doing. So there's a bit of a con there. But the pros are clear. Snap your page, quicker visual response, um, and a, a faster interactivity with the page if you're actually sitting on the device. I'm going to do a quick summary of this stepwise acceleration and show you what we did the whole time. So this is what it looks like. We started here, the very bad thing that I did and then we step through one step at a time, and we got here. And if you go to the performance tracker, which I've now labeled trademark, um, this is what we've done for the entire site. So this is the benefits on this particular site um, that I chose randomly to be cheeky, broke, and then accelerated.